Hey dudes, what's happening? It's Trent here, and uh, as you know, sometimes I like to talk about my dream projects. I've sort of made a career out of doing sequels and revising old games. From the ill-fated Maximo 3, don't forget about Final Fight, Streetwise, to World of Warcraft, Diablo 3, another sequel, and then revising League of Legends, which I got to contribute to re-envisioning that as well. So. I've sort of made a career out of doing redesigns. And so now that I'm kind of doing a lot more of my own thing, I there's so many games that I would love to redesign and, and re-envision and add something new to. And so in this video, we're gonna talk a little bit about the concept artist perspective of what our role is in this whole process of re-envisioning something classic. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about my process from start to finish of how do I put the ideas down on paper and where does it go from there? Uh, what would the process be internally and uh, what is my thought process when I'm trying to capture the essence of the original and bring something fresh and new to it. And so specifically today we're going to be talking about one of my all-time favorite games, the Portal series, Portal 1 and 2. We're going to focus a lot on the character designs mostly and some throw out a lot of ideas that might inspire the rest of the team, some of the the kind of ways that it might shape and influence some of the, the script writing and potentially some of the character development as well and give some cool new gameplay mechanic ideas to the designers. So uh, without any more delay, because you probably just want to jump into seeing some art, let's do it, let's jam. So coming right out of the gate, the, the first thing that we have to realize is that we're not used to the shape language. We're not used to this method of construction. We've been working in, for instance, a medieval fantasy type of a game or a superhero type of a game. And <clears throat> we've got to completely change, shift the way that we think about the construction of the mechanical elements, the, uh, the mechanisms, the machinery. How do things fit together? I immediately pulled up tons of reference that I could kind of pull shape language from. I keep it up on my screen so that I can evaluate how close am I getting to what the original was in terms of its construction. I'm not really worried too much about rendering anything at this point. In fact, I'm mostly just looking for interesting silhouettes that might spark cool ideas. Uh, so for example, I'm looking at the original personality cores during the whole process of this whole thing I'm watching. I've got Portal the movie on YouTube going. Somebody made a fan movie, of course, just compiling all the scenes. So I've got dialogue being pumped into my head. I've got characters' interactions being pumped into my head while I'm putting this together. I'm listening to the soundtrack and I'm trying to get the construction. There's some things that are working. There's some things that are really not working. I was also pulling up some interesting secondary elements for reference, such as some of the, the ghost in the shell type of constructions, although it's very different. Uh, in the world of Portal, it's a lot more sleek and streamlined, and some of the mechanical elements have a weird wave to them. They're almost organic uh, in terms of how they're, they're bent together in almost like a bone type of a shape. And doing this leg specifically right now that you're seeing, I think was really a strong, a strong indicator for me of what was working and what wasn't working to still make it feel like a portal kind of a universe. I also began to really find that I liked this idea of these tiny little T-Rex arms on one of the personality cores. Now this could be Wheatley, it could not be Wheatley. We're not really thinking in terms of exactly what a story is right now, you know, I mean, Ideally, in a development environment, you would have a bit of a script, you know, you would have an idea of what the assignment was, but this is very early blue sky. I'm taking this from the perspective of nobody's told me anything about what Portal 3 is going to be, and nobody has indicated who even the main character is. This is just me doing the very first spitball kind of like blue sky ideations for what may or may not inspire something later on from somebody else on the team. And that's really kind of the point of a lot of this is game development is a team effort. It's something that no person, no singular person really has the full vision of the whole project. In fact, from any project I've ever worked on, really at the blue sky stage early on in development, all you really want to do as a concept artist is to fill like a wall with ideas that and sketches and, and interesting looks, new looks for characters that the team can all sit in there and, and spitball ideas off of. So our role at this stage is really just to inspire. We want to 
unbind ourselves from what was the old version and what could be with the new version. What kind of uh, interesting dynamics that a character might have. Sometimes it's that the character got older or sometimes it's that the character now has a new ability or a new companion or the, the imagery that you see when you're putting it up on the board and the rest of the team is looking at it, it should inspire them to go, oh man, like I want to play off of that idea. And that's really our role as a concept artist in the blue sky stage of early development of a new project. We're not there to do the singular one image that shapes the, the look. I've never seen that happen. A lot of times the external perspective or perception of game development is that a concept artist comes in, does a drawing, a fancy painting with beautifully rendered lighting or something, and then every everybody on the team just gets on board with that guy's design. But I've never seen it actually go that way. If you look through my portfolio on Diablo 3, we spent three, three or four months on every hero, every playable character, just trying to define a basic look, a consistency, a cohesive style amongst the team that would define that this character, okay, this character always has these elements and you can play off of those elements, but there were, I think, maybe eight to ten different concept artists from animators. Well, they weren't all, at Blizzard, everybody does concept art. So technically we would all kick in ideas on things we would sit in a room and evaluate okay we really like these kind of things we really don't like those kind of things and then there would get there would be some kind of a consensus and if there wasn't then that's about the time that the art director would step in and say all right guys we need to go this direction and sometimes it's a very unpopular call that's a very difficult role to be in because you're going to you don't want to demotivate your team either and if you've got people really invested in something they've been putting months of time into designing something um, you really have to have a very strong reason for making a hard call like that so it's still day one and we've just begun to wrap our heads around the shape language and the mechanical design of the universe of portal but let's move on let's uh let's dig into redesigning shell first thing i do is i did actually trace out the uh the posing from a cosplayer because there's a lot of people out there that will just get cranky about, oh, well, her clavicle is crooked or her proportions are off or whatever. And I don't want to waste time trying to master getting the proportions of everything correct right away if I can just use the shortcut. So uh, I jump right into a pose that I feel like will represent some of her personality. She's a strong, confident female character. So because we're approaching this from the perspective of a conceptual artist, we're not just redrawing the character as she existed in Portal 1 or Portal 2, we want to add something unique to it. We want to add something that is interesting. And to do that, I want to keep the essence of what was there before. So, sure, she has her portal gun, also called the Aperture Science Handheld Portal Device. But according to the theories of many astrophysicists, wormholes, uh, which can teleport you from one point to another, can also be used to travel through time. And so by giving Shell this ability to travel between time, we've given her another dynamic level, another gameplay mechanic to play with the player's expectations. And this also is in line with everything that we saw in Portal 1 and Portal 2, where it's really kind of a, a bit of a, it messes with your head a little bit. You know, you're popping through walls, landing on the other side. You're creating perpetual energy machines, which really technically can't exist because of the laws of physics and the trade-off of energies. However, if we start to delve into the realm of time travel, it's sort of the perfect universe to play around with. Now, why do I think that? Why is that? Well, what is she surrounded by except robots? So her companion then in turn can be sort of waiting around for her uh, at different points in time. Perhaps at the very beginning of the game, you take your companion back in time uh, and you establish a link between him so that he always remembers you wherever you are. But in whichever level you're in, he might uh, have a different behavioral destruction or decay. And so you could play around with the player's expectations of where he maybe fixed himself up or he assimilated another personality uh, and he's shifting, he's changing how he communicates with you. Uh, you could also go back to locations that were in Portal 1 or Portal 2 with the intention of uh, maybe solving the problem in a different way because you can now transport 
teleport through time. This could present a lot of fun ways to mess with the player's head in a similar fashion to everything that I loved about Portal 1 and 2. It would also be interesting to sort of finally get some answers, you know, and travel back in time to possibly interface directly with Ratman, uh, the guy who was scribbling messages all over the walls in Portal 2, or to see the origin of the whole cake debacle, how GLaDOS interpreted that whole thing, as well as the uh, relationship between Aperture Science and Black Mesa, which has been alluded to through many of the audio blogs and things like that throughout the games. We could actually experience these events and who knows, even participate possibly. Perhaps Shell even perpetuated the entire sequence of events by traveling back in time and thereby affecting the scientific experiments, which then triggered the, the whole ordeal to happen, which is also in line with that iconic image that you always see of uh, Shell passing between portals in an infinite energy machine. Just as she can loop infinitely between physical spaces, she then loops between time spaces as well from the beginning of Aperture Science all the way through to its demise in the very end. And this could also be reflected in her outfit, in her gear, and how she is preparing to traverse different times and spaces of the Aperture Science lab, whereby perhaps at one point it's dust covered and she can barely see, or there are gaseous fumes from wherever, whatever period of time the earth, the conditions that the atmosphere might be in. So she might have a breathing apparatus of some sort. But the point is, is that by creating this theoretical sort of creative exercise and this possibility, we now have so much to work off of creatively because we've unbound ourselves from the limitations of what once was with the possibilities of what could be. And in a sense, that is really what a conceptual artist's job is. I mean, that and of course, breaking it down into a blueprint so that it can be modeled as well. And so when I begin to uh, doubt some of my color choices and, uh, and when I begin to realize that I just need to focus on the design of things, I switch everything over to grayscale sometimes and just focus on what it is that I'm designing. You know, what story am I telling? Uh, what am I communicating? She's got this jacket and she's wearing, uh, she has like a, a multi-layered kind of a collar thing going on. Um, in some of these uh, variants, I've got her wearing goggles. It's a good idea now and then if you've got an interesting idea that you just want to try out, either create a new layer or pull off a copy of everything off to the side and just try it out, see how it works. I don't know how well these uh, cyborg arms are going to work out, but we also don't know if Shell is even human. So it's really just, I mean, all of these are disposable ideas. They could go in a great way during the meetings or they could go in a horrible way in the meetings. Maybe it's just a cloned copy that's a robotic version of her because GLaDOS got bored, brought her back from the dead or, or downloaded her mind into a brain case and put it in, stuffed it inside of a body. And then we wonder throughout the game, are we even human anymore? And since, of course, time travel is lonely, we don't want her to get lost in the, the miasma of time and space, so we want to give her a companion scarf. Now, I realize that a companion scarf is not necessarily a good idea. It's a little bit too cheeky, I guess. But the, the thing is, is like we're not holding back on ideas. One, when you first look at this image, this is kind of also for a YouTube video, so I realize when you first see this character, I want you to immediately recognize that she is Shell from Portal, and there is that consistency of like, oh, okay, I see it. There's like the companion shape elements, you know. Uh, but it may also be something that sparks an, an interesting other idea. You know, we don't have to think of it as a companion scarf, but it could be something that she becomes attached to in some fashion. It's a pretty cheeseball idea in hindsight, but we're not going to hold back. Uh-uh. We're going in Aperture Science Portal Devices blazing. Which leads me to the next thing I want to talk about, um, which is where this is, this is the point at which uh, right about now is when a number of people will snub my design and point out that it's not realistically rendered. The lighting is incorrect uh, or her proportions are not photorealistically accurate. And in truth, at some point, I became extremely uncertain of my ability to bring something substantially new and innovative to the Portal universe. It's an amazing franchise. It's an amazing game. 
I had my doubts along the way, and I'm not very good at rendering even. In fact, I've often said at many of my workshops, I'm not an artist, I'm a storyteller. I just happen to be able to communicate my ideas visually. This is true, in fact, for many film directors, such as Ridley Scott or James Cameron. They doodle out their ideas, they sketch out these little thumbnails for the, the shot, the camera angle, the information is there, and then they hand it off to somebody who's a much better renderer to communicate that into a final form. Uh, but the important part of my contribution isn't my ability to render to realistic perfection, but rather my ability to inspire new ways of thinking, a new angle, particularly around pre-existing universes. I think it's important to make a distinction between illustration and conceptual design. In my experience, an illustrator tends to look at a lamppost, for instance, and wonders, how do I render this metal in this particular lighting situation? And a, a, an illustrator tends to get very technical. And, and while I think that illustration is valuable as much as, just as much as language is valuable to communicate your ideas, a concept artist looks at a lamppost and wonders, why is that lamppost necessary? How was it designed? Why is it designed that way? Should there be other cultural implications in that lamppost design? What materials did the people who built that lamppost need or have at their disposal? What else does it communicate about their culture in terms of their technological advancement? Is it using electricity or is it using some other form of gaseous energy potentially? Or what kind of shape language is it using? If you were to look at lampposts in Phuket, uh, you would notice that there's a, a specific dragon sh uh, serpent shape that all of these lampposts use. And why is that? Because there are statues also that use the same symbols and the same shape language. It communicates a cultural heritage. It communicates something more. Uh, aesthetically than just the function of a lamppost. And so as a concept artist, I get fascinated with the cultural and uh, technological implications of a design more than just how to render it. And I feel that that is equally valuable in game development and when building a universe and telling a story with design. But as we've sort of defined a lot of our design elements for Shell, you know, now I'm getting into the part where I am doing a little bit of rendering, and it's really, the intention is to render just enough to communicate the idea well. Um, and by that I mean, I'm not going into uh, photorealistic types of materials or anything of that nature. Uh, I really want to get the ideas down quickly. And in fact, uh, this is a good stage to do it in because I've got a design that I feel like is a good direction to go. Now I'm going to pull off variants later and I'm going to come up with more interesting ideas and variations and alternative ideations. And The point with your early blue sky designs is to not focus all of your time on rendering but instead focus on the design itself and uh, communicating an interesting and unique character. That's part of our role as conceptual designers. Ideally we want to have probably by the end of a week we want to have about 20 to 30 if not more uh, just kind of straight on shots like this I'm not gonna go into side view back view or call outs just yet because we're not at that stage yet we still need to get buy-in from the rest of the team I'm eager to get to the point where I've got a sheet with about six or seven different ideas distinctly unique ideas um, that are rendered to about this level of detail. And then I would present those six or seven ideas on a singular sheet uh, to the team and evaluate, you know, are any of these really working? Are any of these sparking any ideas that the designers are getting jazzed about? Or is there anything that's just outright a no? You know, at that point, then I would pursue a bit more of a refined design. You know, there's also the factor of other artists being involved in the development process. You know, is there something that somebody else on the team is uh, doing that's really, really jiving with the rest of the development staff? If so, then maybe I should be trying to incorporate a little bit of what they're doing into my own designs. And so by taking this image to about this level of detail, that's when I would kind of pull off variations and maybe do a more athletic design. Uh, maybe try to incorporate more of the story ideas that I had in mind throughout the development of this image and also maybe pull up some more interesting 
uh, reference material, sometimes you get a really good idea just by taking two ideas that really should not be together and sort of beating them together until they do work. Uh, at this point, I felt like I had brought the, the detail level up to a point where it communicates the idea in a, in a pretty clear fashion. Uh, a modeler could look at this and go, yeah, I could, I could wrap my head around how that's constructed. And I've made a duplicate of it, and I was going to start to create my variants off of that. But uh, along the way, I realized I wanted to go back and touch up the, the first design a little bit more. And sometimes that happens. You dance between different designs. Um, and then, of course, uh, I've sort of reached a point where I wanted to just change it up a little bit. Uh, as to keep it fresh and keep it interesting and so I switched over to working on the personality core the robot design and I don't want to dig into the schematic for this guy yet at this stage it's really just that I need to sell the idea of him as a little bot guy that can work as a companion for her remember my internal story that I'm telling myself is that she is sort of bouncing between different eras of time within Aperture Science and so this particular character would be at different stages of time and history uh, throughout uh, within that, that structure and location. So he's gonna be salvaging different pieces. Maybe he's been reconstructed a few times. Maybe he's gotten dented up pretty bad. Um, I'm not going to figure out the mechanisms just yet uh, because we're not building this to be modeled. Right now, our intentions are to build this to be sold as an idea, a core idea. To the rest of the team if we get sign off if we get buy-in by the rest of the team and people say yeah something like that we love the floating droid kind of an idea you know then that's when we would begin to take the arm and do like a side view schematic a breakdown of its materials what these little power cells and uh, wires are all dangling and connecting to and what each of those little pieces is and uh, a good frame of reference for this would be if you played the vr experience the lab which was created by uh, valve then you would get a, a closer idea of what I would be using for reference for the insides of how these mechanical devices are constructed it was amazing to see these things kind of fall apart and, and see all the parts and how they all fit together really incredible intimidating kind of mechanical design and uh, but again we're not building this for a cinematic kind of a shot Th that would take is to do the actual conceptual design for a final robot of this scale it would probably take a few weeks if even if you had the rest of the team buying into your initial rough sketch design and I enjoy doing that aspect of the process just as much I personally I'm excited to dig into doing a lot more 3d modeling it's been something that uh, I play around with here and there but mostly with low poly kind of things uh, just because I also delve into the world of indie game development. I do a lot of like little programming experiments and I play around with Unreal Engine and Unity Engine and I'm always sort of dropping my models in and it's just seeing like how to understand the pipeline of implementing animations and, uh, and texturing and rendering just so that I have a basic understanding of all aspects of game development, which I think is very valuable. At this point, I decided, you know what, I'm not going to try to be realistic uh, with my design. I'm not going to try to be photorealistic. So I went in and started toying around with her line arts. Uh, I put it all together into my uh, portfolio format that I use, the template that I like to use, and that communicates a lot of the ideas. I wanted to leave little notes as to imply what kind of information I can't immediately communicate visually although sometimes I feel like I over communicate with these things but that's not a bad thing when you're putting together design sheets or portfolio pieces to communicate what it is that people are looking at I looked at somebody's portfolio at LCAD the other day uh, I was kind of filling in for a friend of mine and, and teaching a class and I was looking at this young man's portfolio and he had long drawn out paragraphs next to a lot of his designs explaining what we were looking at and while that's useful and fun and I think it's very valuable for a conceptual designer to think about I think that when you're putting it in your portfolio you want to keep it down to a few words you don't want to have like long drawn out explanations ultimately I don't necessarily feel like stylistically I've nailed it in any way I don't feel that portal should go the way of overwatch for instance or to have uh, more stylization, although I tend to gravitate more towards stylized games because I feel that they have a longer shelf life. 
if you look at the gamut of photorealistic games in general, they tend to wither away a lot more quickly. Even if the game design is really good, you, then you have to do a remaster and you redo all the textures. But if you just get a style down, if you look at TF2, people can still play Team Fortress 2 and feel like it's an absolutely gorgeous game even to this day. I can cite you a, a number of examples where this is true. Most of the games that I've worked on have a little bit longer shelf life because of this. But that is entirely a huge discussion for another time. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention, this is about seven to eight hours of drawing time for this image. If I were to do this in-house, it would take about a day and a half, including all the meetings that you're probably going to go through. And so there you have it. Uh, that's my fantasy project redesign of uh, the main characters from Portal. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, it was fun to do. I seldom get a chance to really sit down and I mean it's truly just a pleasure to be able to paint something and design something that I love um, and to be able to share it with you guys. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the design as well as the process. Uh, some of my opinions might be unpopular but uh, that's okay. I mean I'm coming from years and years of experience doing it and maybe uh, maybe you've got a better idea on how to handle it for yourself and that's alright too man I'm not here to tell you what you should think or how you should think as a conceptual designer I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong if you have a, a different process and it works well for you then I 100% support you I wish you guys the best if you are an artist and you are interested in hearing more about my process I do have a series of Gumroad tutorials in huge box sets that are 30 to 40 hours long and you can pick those up in the link in the text field below the video all right dudes remember uh with whatever you do if you're going to redesign characters remember redesign classic characters with passion all right dudes uh that's it for me i'll catch you all manyanda bond ciao